The thing about video games is that they can be good at a certain price tag, but a lot of video games cost $60 and even $70 for certain modern titles. Unfortunately, not a lot of them are worth that price. It doesn't mean that they're bad, they're just really bad prices. Let's talk about the Famicom Detective Club duology. The what duology you might ask? Well, you might not know that Nintendo used to make visual novels called Famicom Detective Club back in the day. It's a murder mystery story and there are only two stories released with two episodes each. The duology got remastered and re-release exclusively for the Nintendo Switch, because of course it is, it wouldn't be titled Famicom otherwise. That's just how it is with Nintendo products, all of them go exclusively to Nintendo consoles. That and the two episodes of this game cost $60! Two visual novels, not games with actual proper gameplay, visual novels, $30 each episode, totaling $60 for the duology. That really doesn't sound good, right? But it gets worse. If you buy the episodes individually, they cost $35! This has got to be some really good visual novel to cost that much. Oh yeah, Nintendo, I can save 10 bucks to buy the complete bundle. Ugh, what a deal. Christ. To put this in perspective, the Ace Attorney HD Trilogy is priced half, and you get three games with around five episodes each. Nintendo here is trying to sell you two Ace Attorney episodes, not games episodes for $35 each and $60 in a bundle. Well, some visual novels can cost $30. This $35 visual novel must have been very long then, right? It took me two to three hours to beat one. That's the length of one Ace Attorney episode. Every Ace Attorney game should have around five episodes and you can get three Ace Attorney games for $30. My God, Nintendo, no wonder why you're considered some of the greediest gaming companies out there. You're on the right mind to preserve some of Nintendo's oldest legacies and remake them for the modern times. That's amazing. I'm all for that. But God damn it, Nintendo, it's a visual novel for God's sake. You're charging $60 for two? Ace Attorney episodes? I mean, yes, the graphics and the character designs are updated for modern times, but it's still a visual novel. I wouldn't buy it for $60. But hey, at least all of the remastering are done by you and not outsourced into some other game company. It's outsourced into some other game company. Enter Mages, formerly known as 5PB. They're the guys who worked on the original Steinsgate alongside Nitro Plus. They also published many other visual novel works, most notably ones that have semicolon in the title like Chaos Head, Chaos Child, and Robotic Notes. So they got some really good resume, and they got hired by Nintendo Senpai to remake their older works in the system. Personally, I think Nintendo is doing the absolute bare minimum in this remake. The games and the stories already exist, the mechanics also already already exists. All that Nintendo did is to provide the template for mages to work for and a platform where they can sell them at a ridiculously high price. So I recommend you guys to buy mages' other works like Steins Gate and directly pay them for their efforts here instead of having it being filtered by Nintendo's crap revenue sharing. I already bought Steins Gate and Steins Gate Zero because I like them. I even bought Chaos Child as well, but I'm not paying for this trash deal. Not a chance. And I didn't. I got this off of my good friends on the Straw Hat Gang. And I played this game on Ryujinx, a Switch emulator on a PC. It's perfectly playable on it. I mean, of course it has to. It's a freaking visual novel. It's not exactly Crisis. Now, let's assume that you can get these two games through the gray areas of the internet, or that you have these two games thanks to giving $60 to Nintendo. Are these two games at least worth spending your time on? Let's find out. There are two stories in the Famicom Detective Club. The Missing Heir is the first one to be released, but it's actually the sequel, whereas The Girl Who Stands Behind is the last to be released, and is the prequel, so it's kinda like Red Dead Redemption 1 and 2. You play as a teenager who just so happened to be working on the detective agency, and you can name yourself whoever you like. For the purpose of this video, I named my character Suichi Akai, just a random character name I generated out of my head. The premise of The Girl Who Stands Behind is that Suichi is a runaway adopted by the detective to work on a detective agency and you are tasked to solve a crime involving the death of a high school girl whose ghost is apparently haunting everyone. Ooh. The premise of The Missing Heir is that you are now a detective working on the agency but you got knocked out to the point where you got amnesia. You're trying to remember everything that happened previously and piece together every single thing including the current case that you're working on which is a suicide case that doesn't seem like a suicide. The thing is, there's no Famicom Detective Club in this game. No 
group of nerds who play the Famicom gather up to form a detective club and solve cases, the Famicom is just where the platform is, or was. If this game is on the Nintendo 64, it would be named Detective Club 64, and people will get confused when they play the game and they couldn't find the other 63 detective clubs. By the game's naming logic, this game would technically be the Switch Detective Stories. There's no club in the game at all, and the main character isn't even a high schooler. He's roughly the same age as one, but he doesn't go to one. Actually, a more accurate title of this game would be Urban Legend Detective, because that's what the protagonist stumbles into and investigates. Every episode will deal with an urban legend happening in the setting, and as the days keep on going, the urban legend becomes more and more prominent, to the point where it genuinely feels real, and the characters get more and more terrified. It's up to the protagonist to see if the urban legend is real, or if there's something more sinister behind it. Before we go to the story of each game, let's talk about the gameplay. The gameplay of this one is your typical Ace Attorney-like adventure game. You can go from one crime scene to another, or one location to another, examine the areas around you, ask the people for information, and you have to keep doing that until you can get to the next area. If you're one of those people who hate how Ace Attorney can be a lot of trial and error, get a load of this game. This game is even worse. I played this game with a no spoiler walkthrough because I don't want to waste my goddamn time on pointless trial and error BS, and even then there are times where I have to shuffle through many of the options trying to figure out what the hell I just miss. It could be just that the walkthrough is really bad, but it could also be just how the game is really badly designed. If you want to proceed through the game, you have to pick specific dialogue topics at a specific order, and sometimes you have to pick them more than once in order for the characters to actually talk and for the levels to proceed. I don't know why I have to select certain dialogues multiple times. Just show me the entire freaking thing. It's not like the characters are going anywhere. Don't make me ask the same topic and make them to repeat the same answers so that I don't look like a lunatic. Ace Attorney's dialogues consist of one topic, and once the topic is done, you move on to the next, and the one you select the last time gets checked. It's a more streamlined approach that at least guarantees progress. This game, however, doesn't guarantee progress until you try to select all of the options. There's one time where I literally have no idea how to proceed, I decided to examine the school's clock out of curiosity, and that's where I can finally proceed! How the hell am I supposed to know that? And yet, Nintendo is really adamant that this visual novel gameplay has to be preserved as well, no matter how janky, inconvenient, repetitive, and frustrating it is, all with the authentic experience of games being super expensive during the Famicom days. So a lot of time is being wasted on this game is not trying to investigate the clues and witnesses and suspects, but trying to figure out which option lets you to proceed to the next level through loads of trial and error. But what about the stories themselves? Let's start off with the prequel story, The Girl Who Stands Behind. That's the first story that I played, and it started off really interesting. A teenager is on the run from some people, and a detective adopted him to make him work on the agency. We don't really know who Shuichi is, he just so happened to stumble upon the detective. A murder case happens, and he gets to be the one doing the solving for the most part, while the detective is just there mentoring him. What I find surprising about this game is that most of the characters are written in a jarringly realistic manner. Despite the anime art style, I'm not sensing a lot of the typical anime cliches as I progress through the game. The characters feel like real people with real emotions and feelings. I know this because because for most of the characters, their personality and archetypes are not so obvious from the first moment you meet them. There are exceptions, of course, but the writing on the characters somehow managed to create this surreal, down-to-earth and realistic atmosphere. The people feel real, in my opinion, and that makes the situation feels even more real and even more unsettling. That said, the protagonist is an exception to that statement. He's just a bland anime protagonist archetype all the way through. Generic, nameless protagonist 721 is just filling up the checklist archetype without any forms of arc or evolution that signifies his growth as a person. I don't like how we spend a lot of time inside his head, but his inner thoughts and responses are so bland and generic. He expresses himself in the most plain of ways, with the most plain of thoughts. I hate when games make protagonists where you're supposed to channel yourself into them. I want to play a character in a game with actual definable personality, not a generic blank sheet of paper every man. As for the story itself, it's actually pretty good, and I really like it. The urban legend on this one involves the ghost of a dead girl, and the visual novel handles the story pretty well. The mystery buildup is interesting, the twists and turns and reveals are fun to figure out, the main character doesn't have a significant arc, but some of the characters do have an arc, and I really like their progression. The visual novel structure can really kill the pacing sometimes, but it's still enough to drive me into the end goal. What about the sequel, The Missing Heir? Well, 
The Missing Air is the sequel, but I can kind of see how this is the first game. The protagonist starts off having amnesia, and that pretty much just resets his entire state of mind, which allows him and us as the audiences to figure out what's going on. It's a really nice way to restart the status quo, and I like how the game skips some of the information by making the character to go, Oh right, I have a save file of the prequel game, let me reload that to remind myself what the hell happened, or at least some parts of it. Out of the two stories, I personally really like The Missing Air a lot more. It's centered on an urban legend involving a curse, and how every single member of a family will be killed one by one by the wrath of a curse. The effect on the urban legend becomes more real as more bodies pile up, with people being genuinely shaken and terrified by the prospect. And as I said before, the writing on the characters are jarringly realistic for the most part, which makes the situation even more unsettling in my opinion. Though, I'd like to point out once again that the protagonist is still crap in this one. Despite having a much more significant role than the prequel episode, he's still just your typical bland protagonist that doesn't really evolve as a character. I don't feel his arc whatsoever. I don't feel how the story's big reveal contributes into making him a more likable or sympathetic individual. That said, the big twist regarding his role to the overall story? I really like that. I genuinely didn't see that coming. Good job, game. So yeah, I like The Missing Air too. I feel like it has more stakes and sense of danger. The prequel has a lot more sense of dread and creepiness looming around, and it's pretty unsettling, especially as people are panicking and feeling more and more like they're being haunted by the girl around the school. The sequel has all of that sense of dread and creepiness, plus the notion that anyone can die at any moment, including the protagonist. The depiction of the adult fear that's lingering thanks to the urban legend is shockingly realistic and in my opinion, is a lot more impactful than the school setting. Overall, the Famicom Detective Club duology remake is a visually stunning and marvelous visual novel, but a lot of its gameplay elements are restrained by its dated and frustrating 80s adventure game design and logic. But that said, the story overall is pretty good. It manages to build a great sense of atmosphere and intrigue with a writing that is surprisingly more down to earth and realistic than the anime art style might suggest. Or at least for the most part it is. I find it a surprisingly good experience overall. But for $60? Not a chance, Nintendo! If by some miracle both of these games got discounted to $10 a game, sure, go ahead and buy them. I think they're great for $20 total. If you can grab the ROMs of these two games and play them on Yuzu or Yujinx, go right ahead. They're visual novels, so they're playable for the most part. And if you feel guilty of going through the Tortuga network, you can pay for the losses by buying Mages' other visual novels and other platforms too. At least the dollars will go straight to them, rather than getting filtered by Nintendo's strict revenue shares.